Number four. We farther object to the civil government of this country because its officers are sworn by necessary implication to support what God Almighty forbids, as appears from the oath of office, quote, Members of the General Assembly and all other officers, executive and judicial, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support the Constitution of this Commonwealth, unquote. Here, footnote. See the oath of office, Constitution of the State of Pennsylvania, Article 8. If, therefore, the Constitution of Pennsylvania, as has already been demonstrated, supports and legally establishes gross heresy, blasphemy, and idolatry, it necessarily follows that those who swear to support it are bound by solemn oath to support the above principles and practices, which is nothing more than a practical application of said instrument in their respective administrations. Is not this a glaring contradiction of the moral law? not only in its general precepts, such as first, second, and third commandments, etc., but also to the particular illustration of these precepts. See Deuteronomy 7, verse 5, when speaking of idolaters, quote, Thus shall ye deal with them. Ye shall destroy their altars and break down their images, and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire, unquote. But this obligation to support gross heresy is not confined to officers under the Constitution. It extends to all who swear allegiance to it and thus incorporate with the national society upon the footing of this bond of union. To what purpose is a constitution if it does not contain a solemn stipulation between each and every individual and all the rest of the society for the mutual guarantee of the privileges therein specified? We cannot, therefore, swear allegiance because we dare not be bound upon pain of perjury, if need be, to spend our blood and treasure in supporting the man of sin or any of his allies. And I have never been able to satisfy myself how it was consistent in those who profess Presbyterianism to swear an oath which involved the supporting of idolatry, while at the same time, in their creeds and church constitutions, they solemnly recognized their obligation in their respective stations to remove every monument and vestige of it from the land. And here a footnote. See the larger catechism question 108 as ratified in their church constitutions. Number five. They make no provision for the interest of true religion. See Federal Constitution, Article 8, Amendment. And though there is some appearance of the Christian religion in some part of the state constitution, such as Massachusetts, Part 1, Article 3, yet that article respecting the rights of conscience, which lays the foundation and terminates in the establishment of everything called religion, which may not interfere with temporal safety, is, quote, a dead fly, unquote, to this precious ointment. This indifference about the religion of Jesus is contrary to the law of nature, which requires rulers, quote, chiefly to care for the honor of God, the governor of nations, and to adopt and enforce his laws as the best means for promoting the supreme end, which requires that men should be governed as having immortal souls and not as mere brute animals about whose body only we are concerned, unquote. Contrary to the word of God, which teacheth, quote, that righteousness exalteth the nation, whereas sin even blasphemy and idolatry, as well as other sins, is the reproach of any people. Unquote. Proverbs 14, verse 34. This indifference about the religion of Jesus is in opposition to the promised blessings in the word of God. The exercise of the magistrate's power in favor of the true religion is promised as a blessing in the New Testament times. Isaiah 49, verse 23. Quote, Kings shall be thy nursing fathers. Unquote. Let the law of God be established as a rule, and that will, of course, establish truth. The allegation usually brought forward against this position, that is, quote, that the law of God is so equivocal that it cannot be understood and so ought not to be made the basis of legislation, unquote, is invalid. If it be admitted the divine law is no longer a rule of faith in manners, and God only imposed upon his rational subjects in giving them a law that was unintelligible and at the same time annexing the most tremendous penalties to the violation of it. We are usually taught to have other views of the God of mercy and truth. But can there be anything plainer or clearer than the precepts of the Decalogue, in which we have a summary of the moral law, a bright transcript of the perfections of Jehovah? What is all the prescriptive part of the Bible but an elucidation or comment upon the precepts respectively? What are all the promises and threatenings but the sanctions of that law? applied to the respective cases by God in order to enforce duty and deter from disobedience? Would it be considered as unwarrantable in a court of justice to acquit a criminal arraigned at the bar because he pleads, quote, the law 
with respect to the breach of which I am charged was unintelligible, or I had as good a right to explain it as another, the true meaning of it, I think, I have fulfilled. I demand my liberty." Unquote. Must this law ever after cease to be a rule? If this is admitted, there is an end to all government, and men will, as in those days, when there was no king in Israel, quote, quote, do every man that which is right in his own eyes. Unquote. But in opposition to this, see the conduct of the pious kings of Judah, Second Chronicles thirty one and Second Chronicles thirty four.